This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. You know, I had questions like, oh, is she, a, is she a voodoo priestess? You know, craziness. And I'm like, and if I am, what does it matter? So much racism. I was told in order for me to pass the, um, the national exam that I had to think like a white woman. Being able to live in St. Louis and see how broken it was and then seeing what happened to me and then having the power to create beauty, it allowed me to say that St. Louis can look like this. It can exist like this. And now it's caught on. Last month, Protesters, mourners, and family members convened in Ferguson to mark the 10th anniversary of the Ferguson Uprising. A decade later, what began as a mass protest against the killing of Mike Brown has unfolded into different movements. In so many ways, the event inspired people to organize and take action. Those movements aren't just focused on the region's police departments and courtrooms. Over the last month, St. Louis Public Radio's podcast, We Live Here, has been exploring what changed in the last decade since Ferguson, telling the stories of the new systems that are being built and the people building them. One of those people is Okunshola Amadou, founder and CEO of Jama Birth Village. Founded in 2015, Jama is a black midwifery and maternal health care center located in Ferguson. Yet Ferguson wasn't always part of Okunshola's plans. Her path there was informed by her own experiences in maternal health, which included two traumatic pregnancies. Okunshola is far from alone. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause when compared to white women. Last month, Okunshola Amadou sat down with our own Danny Wisentowski, a producer on the show and the current mini-season of STLPR's We Live Here podcast. Danny began the interview by asking Okunshola to take us back in time to 2013, one year before the Ferguson uprising. In 2013, I found myself in Ghana um, very passionately seeking a new way to live and exist as a black woman, um, a new way to reclaim my, reclaim my identity as a mother, um, after having two traumatic birthing experiences, uh, dedicating my life to becoming a birth worker, a doula, and a midwife, I had an opportunity to have a very beautiful birthing experience, a home birth at home with midwives and doulas. At that time, there were zero black midwives in a very, very small handful of black doulas practicing in St. Louis, like less than 10. And after giving birth to my son, the during the process, the entire community was rooting for me. Um, you know, I was a part-time librarian. I didn't make a lot of money, but I refused to go back to the same system that harmed me and that made me feel small and unimportant. So my community rooting around me for a safe, healthy birth, uh, them I did a fundraiser, them helping to pay for my safe, healthy birth, having that beautiful birth. And then them saying, you're going to be our black community midwife that we need. So when it was when I received the vision and the calling to go to Africa, my community gave me a send off party and I went happy, full of joy. And it was there that I realized that we had been lied to. We had been lied to about our culture, about who we are, who we were, um, that are not only birthing cultures and rituals and ceremonies were so potent and powerful um, as a passageway, as a portal for new life to come in fully intact, whole. And by them burning and attempting to erase that, we were being born through fractured systems that minimalized who we were, that oppressed us from the start. So taking me back to that time, pushing through every boundary, wrapping my baby on my back and going to Ghana, I stayed there for over four months. You know, I think there's a lot of stories about what brings people to leave their mm-hmm. home. And, and, and St. Louis is not 
where you were born or your but you you had been here for a while you had experienced some really hard stuff that that decision to leave was yes. it did you have to find something was there a recognition that this place wasn't ready for you or or had hurt you yes uh it's a circle i'll be honest um just to take it a little bit of a step back, I'm a Texas native. I'm from a, a small central Texas town, and uh, and it was like a village. You know, my cousins, aunties, uncles, grandparents, everybody stayed within a few blocks radius. Everybody's doors were unlocked. We ran around barefoot. We made dirt pies. <laughs> We'd jump on trampolines until late in the evening. It was safe. It was fun. We were quote unquote poor, but we had joy and happiness. Coming to St. Louis as a kindergartner was shattering. It was distant. It was foreign. It was um, not close knit. It was predatory in a sense, um, both from peers and adults. And and St. Louis did break me. St. Louis did hurt me. St. Louis was not safe for me. So going to Ghana, I had to leave because I knew that I deserved something better. I knew that black women around me deserved something better. I knew my children deserved something better. So the visions that I got to go there, I had to find out, even though everybody thought I was crazy. So my last day being in Ghana, uh, before coming back to St. Louis, I didn't want to come back, I'll say that, but I had to. But that is, I, I'm a priestess, a water priestess of uh, Yemoya, and she's a West African um, Orisha or deity, some people would call. And she is a deity that's known that protected and watched over our uh, some of our ancestors who were forced to uh, be brought here through the transatlantic slave trade. So I prayed to her at the water every morning where I lived. And this day when I was leaving, I prayed to her like I always did and said, I got to leave. I'm going home. But like, please don't let this be in vain. What I've learned here from midwives and from healers. And it was there, as I finished singing the song that I sang every morning, that I received a vision to not just become a midwife, not just be a private practice home birth midwife, but to build a birthing village. So that vision brought me back to Ferguson and to to create the, the village and to not be a colonizer in a sense and say, well, I'm going to go to Africa and I'm going to build this birthing village in Africa you know, no, my own community needed. So I came back to create also what I needed. You talked about, I think, having a vision to go to Ghana, but also on that last day before you returned. And I think you, you said that you would sing a, so- a song that you sing every day. Yes. What, what is that? So uh, it was a song that I sang to Yemoya and... Um, I will do my best. <laughs> this is if, a, if it's okay, if it's if absolutely, it's, yeah. If you would share with us, that. yeah, it's just I'm not the top choir singer, but the song is, um, "Yemo ya eso su eso su yemo ya yemo ya eso su." Eso su yemoya yemoya olodo olodo yemoya yemoya olodo olodo yemoya and that means that um, yemoya she's the mother of the water and the fishes in the sea and she's also the mother and the guardian over mothers and babies and pregnant bodies so that is in yoruba and uh, there's different tunes that you can sing it but that is the way i used to sing it at the water and it was a call and response where i would go to the water barefoot i would sing that song and then the water would come up and meet my feet, like, okay, I heard you. And then I would say, okay, and I would go on and pray and then walk away. That day, instead of the water coming to my feet, I kind of waited like, oh, on my last day, you're not going to come and greet me. But instead of the water coming to my feet, it was this huge, huge, huge wave. And I was like, all right, <laughs> I got a flight to catch, you know, like I wasn't expecting a huge wave. I must have sang better today. Thank you for sharing that with You're us. You're welcome. That was beautiful. Thank you. So you arrive back uh, fall or the summer of 2013. 
And you meet a different kind of wave, I guess, mm. about a year later. The protests really surprise everyone. It Tell us a bit about how you experienced that and how close you got to that. And, and you know, I know there, there were businesses that were incredibly damaged um, yes. by this and others whose lives were changed in a lot of ways. H- how did it change yours? It changed my life uh, immensely. At that time, um, I was working at a herb shop in Maplewood. Um, and, you know, I was just, you know, living my life, quote unquote, normally planning to, you know, start organization, doing a little bit of campaigning around midwifery and doula work in the community. And then I remember the day um, that the shooting took place. My sister graduated from UMSL. So I went to her graduation with my family and we had an after party at my parents' house. They were out of town. And even though we were adults, it kind of felt like we were having a, a party while they were gone. And we were watching Set It Off. And then I remember going home and I remember pulling up and going, taking the children in and laying them down for sleep. And I came outside of my backyard. And that's when I started. By that time, it had hit the news what had happened. It was late in the evening. And I felt the air. And it was this thickness, and I just said, something is very wrong, and we're never going to be the same again. And I did not know the extent of what was going to happen. And it was the next day when the sun came up and everything started to transpire. I was on West Florissant maybe about an hour before the quick trip caught on fire. I wanted to, I'm a part of the community, and I still didn't quite know the brevity of what was happening, but I just wanted to be sure that my voice was a part of lifting it to say, we do need change. I remember going home and just watching the news because I couldn't stay out late. I wanted to be with my children. And I remember um, just seeing everything on the news and my children just being terrified. I remember my son thought it was the end of the world. I remember my children not being able to go to school. I remember me not going to work. It was like watching the looting, seeing, you know, everything in the roads and then in the streets. It was literally, it felt like you're in the middle of a war. And I think it hit home for me when the Little Caesars caught on fire. And that, I remember watching the news and seeing the Little Caesars on fire and then turning and looking out of my front window on Marguerite, and it's like a straight beam that you can see all the way at the top of the hill because we were down the slope. And I could see some of the flames and smoke from there. So I'm looking at the TV and turning, looking around. I'm like, this is not real. So it was a cascading feeling of emotion. I did not feel hopeless, though. I knew that I had a role to play. I just wasn't quite sure at that point what it was. That's Okunshola Amadou, founder and CEO of Jama Birth Village. She spoke with St. Louis on the Air producer Danny Wisentowski about her work to create the Birth Village and the events of the Ferguson Uprising 10 years ago. We need to take a quick break, but we'll continue this conversation when we come back. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back. Let's return to the conversation with Okunshola Amadou, founder and CEO of Jama Birth Village. Before the break, Okunshola described how she found inspiration while living in Ghana to create a birthing village and how she brought that dream with her when she moved back to Ferguson in 2013. It was there only one year later that protesters took to the streets after the killing of Michael Brown. Okunshola talked about that time in her life in an interview with producer Danny Wisentowski. Let's listen. Did you join the protest yourself? 
or have a chance to experience that? I had a chance to experience it twice. I was not a regular protester in the street. Um, it was more around gathering birth workers. In, in, in what context around the protests? So the, the first context was me on that Sunday after the shooting, uh, being in the community and meeting with other people, uh, talking and holding space, and then joining in the chants and joining in the outcries. Um, and then I believe it was maybe a couple of days later, you know, within still the first week, um, I found myself back down on West Florissant, um, where the mini mart is. It was kind of next to a beauty supply. And down there again, it was when the police had thickened their presence and they were pushing back and starting the divide. But I'm not going to lie, it hurt me because I wanted to be there. But I did have to make the difficult decision around choosing how I protested because of my children. And I knew that some people were like, I don't care, I'm going to be down here no matter what happens. But for me, uh, having to follow how I pray and the calling over me, it said, you have a role to play just not being in the street. You do need to be with your sons at home. Um, I was a single parent at the time. And so I just waited until it was my time to do the work the way I needed to do it. Was there a point in the Ferguson uprisings or, or seeing just everything that was happening that you regretted coming back? Um, that is such a great question. There's parts of me that just always just want to get through the agreement I made with the creator and becoming a midwife and building the birthing village and building the birthing center so I can just go back to Africa. That is the truth. Um, I don't regret it because I know that I am here to bring about change for my community and greater humanity and normalizing and modernizing um, traditional and quote unquote ancient, but true ways of birthing and bring, bringing in life and honoring the life and well being of the mother, the portal of life. So I didn't necessarily regret it. It was excruciatingly hard. But, you know, growing up and living in the Ferguson, Florissant area, that was my home. And so um, when I started Jamabur Village, first we were meeting organically in the Ferguson Public Library. So around the same time that um, the Michael Brown, you know, shooting shooting took place, we were organically meeting at the library um, and talking about the lack of access. And so um, a year later in 2015, before we were founded in October, we did a community um birth work survey to ask what did the community know about midwives and doulas? What did they want? What did they need? What did they know about home births and birthing centers? And they were very loud and clear. We had no idea that midwives were a thing for us. Um, we don't even know how to pay for them or access them. We, we want to have these options. We want childbirth education. They gave us a list of things. And when, you know, I recognize that this is not just a, a movement, <laughs> you know, this is not just me going to school. That's when I understood we need to form Jamaa Birth Village into a not-for-profit so that we can fund the birthing experiences that people wanted, needed, and deserved. So we, st I founded Jamaa Birth Village out of my home. We left the library and started meeting in my living room. So our home was the first Jamaa Birth Village. I started providing midwifery care as a student under my preceptors in my living room for six months. And when we got our first brick and mortar, it was in Ferguson across from the waterfall right across the street from UMB Bank. So Ferguson is where um, I came back immediately after Ghana. So it was where the vision landed me. It was a seed and we've grown it and sustained it. And it will always be our home. Take me to that moment of where you became, I think, Missouri's first black midwife. Certified professional Certified. midwife. So I started midwifery school at the Midwives College of Utah on a full scholarship uh, in 2015. And I graduated in 2019, and I became Missouri's first black certified professional midwife. Um, 
while I want to say, you know, when I received news of my scholarship, I I jumped off of the ground in my backyard. I still have this cute little fuzzy picture of me like in midair. My sons did a great job taking the picture. But by the time I graduated college and sat for my national exam, I disappeared for two months. I was, I literally was like, um, burnt out isn't even the word, beaten down. I faced so much racism and so much dwindling and bias and it it was mind blowing. So when you think about the same uh, biases and systemic and structural racism that black women face in the maternal health care system, black birth workers face the same thing. It's intentional. So um, it was hard. Um, I was told in order for me to pass the um, the national exam that I had to think like a white woman. And um, how? <laughs> I'm black, 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 <laughs> like Afrocentric black. And um, I had to live with white midwives and deal with um, so much from, from white women and white midwives just to get through. I ultimately, I had, I moved away from Missouri and went to Virginia for three months to finish midwifery school so I could be a midwife for my community because that's how thick the racism is. So I was proud. I was happy and I wish that it wasn't overshadowed by so much pain. So because I did have to become whiteness in a sense just to make it through because I had clients that complained about the jewelry that I wore. I would wear, you know, Ankh jewelry or crystal jewelry or cowrie shells. And, you know, I had questions like, oh, is she a, is she a voodoo priestess? You know, craziness. And I'm like, and if I am, what does it matter? So I'm here to, you know, provide the highest quality care. I'm not asking what your religion is. So with that being said, I did have to code switch. I did have to water down sometimes to make it through. So I focused on um, going away for a couple of months and trying to extract as much whiteness out of myself as possible so I could come back to my community and practice fully black <laughs> as my community needed. You know, listening to you, there's kind of almost like two ways I could, I could imagine telling this story. Mm -hmm. You go to Ghana and mm -hmm. then you return to St. Louis and you turn St. Louis into a little slice of that place that yes. you left. I think there's another version that, you know, Ghana and St. Louis are different. Yes. And you had to come here to find, you know, what is the expression of real community look mm. like here, this place with its own history and its own problems. Which, what, is it, what does it feel like to you? It's both. It's hybrid. It's, if I would not have gone to Ghana I would have just been a private practice midwife and I would have tried to bundle in this holistic uh, sacredness that I'm telling you about and go one by one. I would have only been able to touch a small number of families. So going back to Ghana, which is very different from St. Louis, and getting permission from my elders to, yes, bring as much of that here as I can, um, that has been beautiful and amazing. Um, I mean, I love Texas, and I still go home to Texas a lot. You know, I, I commute and spend a lot of time with my family as my elders get older. Um, and St. Louis is also my home. But me coming to Texas is a very midwife-friendly state. Texas does not have the problems we have in regards to midwifery. And midwifery is a direct solution based off of the World Health Organization and the International Confederation of Midwives is a direct solution to minimizing mater maternal mortality and morbidity. So I feel like I was brought here to see how broken and disenfranchised and, um, you know, void St. Louis was of real, true um, community birth work. So with that being said, being able to live in St. Louis and see how broken it was and then seeing what happened to me and then having the power to create beauty and then getting like the essence, I, you know, it allowed me to say that um, St. Louis can look like this. It can exist like this. And now it's caught on. Um, I am still the, um, you know, the only black certified professional midwife in Missouri, but not for much longer. 
at least 20 other black women have been inspired by the work of Jamal Birth Village and myself and have stepped into their own power and calling. You know, sometimes you just need to see that it can be done. When, again, I talked about that small group of black doulas, less than 10 at that time, Jamal Birth Village has now trained over 463 doulas since we were founded in 2015. And I, I talk about St. Louis and Ferguson specifically being unsafe at that time. We were funded through Merck for Mothers through a, um, an initiative called the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative. And it provided us with three years worth of funding to train 360 doulas to help to bring the circle of continuity back around and to restructure hospital systems to respect doulas and respect black birthing women. So back to that vision, when I say in 11 years I've done just that, we have one more piece of the puzzle, which is to get our birthing center. Right now there are zero freestanding birthing centers um, at, at all in the state of Missouri. The closest one is on the Kansas City, Kansas border, but it's in Kansas. So let me ask you, there's, there may be a time in the future where you'll, you'll be at the airport and you'll have <laughs> all of your stuff and you'll be with your family. And you'll be going back to Ghana. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what does the St. Louis that you are leaving look like in that moment? Oh, wow. I love that vision. Look at the vision you're giving me. I'm so overjoyed. You can see how much I love Ghana. The St. Louis that I'm leaving looks so happy and joyous. I even see people holding up signs and waving and I see babies bouncing on mama's hips with signs, you know, just saying thank you and people standing there with their midwives and their doulas. And I see joy. Um, I see communities. Our goal has always been every zip code within the promise zone having a, min a minimum of five doulas in their community, bringing back that community birth worker, neighborhood, midwife thing. I see that. I see people not having to drive all the way to Ferguson, you know, and saying, I have a midwife right down the street from me or a doula right down the street from me I can go to. So I see joy. I see access. I see people saying, well, I can't afford it, but I know a place where I can go to where I can get my doula or my midwife paid for. Um, I see longevity because we're working with state legislators to pass uh, laws um, that pay black birth workers and protect black mothers. And see, I, I see longevity at the state level and at hospital levels where they can't hide anymore and they can't do the okie doke and we're holding them to the flame and it'll be hard to undo. So I see an entire region that looks like full green lush trees and land and happiness and more babies and more mamas living, you know, less obituaries, um, less sadness from loss and more happiness that mothers are growing up breastfeeding and raising their children and uh, husbands have their wives and um, people have their partners. Um, less sadness from depression because people have doulas who can teach them how to nourish their bodies and how to no uh, notice signs of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So if I was to put a bow on it, it is so much joy, love, and happiness when I leave and go back to Ghana. That's Okunshola Amadou, founder and CEO of Juma Birth Village. She spoke with St. Louis on the Air producer Danny Wisentowski about her work to create the Birth Village and the events of the Ferguson Uprising 10 years ago. You can also hear her on the latest episode of We Live Here, which is out today. It tackles the tough choices Black parents are making when it comes to schools. This episode was produced by Danny Wisentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. 
Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. 